I want to begin with a scenario. I want to get you to imagine for a moment a place probably as big as this, but utterly, utterly gorgeous with gold and drapery and quite amazing. And over here, there's a figure. He stands here. He is powerful. He's got the power of life and death over you. He has huge wealth and he is just so influential. And he is watching that over in the corner of the room over here, there is a group of men and they are arguing with each other. They're recriminating, they're confessing, they're angry with each other, they're angry with their own things, they feel so guilty, they're really worried and they don't know that he can understand every word they're saying. They think he doesn't know our language, we can just talk honestly amongst ourselves and this is an awful situation we find ourselves in. But he has the power to have life or death over them. Can you think to me who that person might be in the Bible that was standing there watching this group of men arguing with each other, recriminating, why did we do that thing? God will punish us and now we're in this awful situation. Who was he? Joseph, exactly. And I want you to turn with me now to the scripture because we're going to focus very heavily on it today. So let's start with Genesis 37 and let's just talk about Joseph's life for a moment or two because there are so many good lessons in this scripture. So you want Genesis chapter 37. And yes, I deliberately do not have PowerPoint because I think we're becoming a whole batch of lazy Adventists who don't bother to look up our Bibles and just sit there and wait for it to go up on the screen. You know, what are we going to do when, when we really need our Bibles? There's not going to be a PowerPoint there. You need to know it and you need to treasure it and read it. My Bible's getting pretty tatty looking, but because I've underlined things, I can find them more easily, so it's helpful. All right, so let's look at Genesis um, 37. Now, my edition is New Century, but you read along in whatever you've got. So, chapter 37 of Genesis, and we're looking down in verse 2. Joseph was a young man, 17 years old. Now, take notice of that, 17 years old. He and his brothers cared for the flocks, and his brothers were the, sins of, uh, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph gave his father bad reports about his brothers. First clue of the way this story is going to pan out. Nasty little tatty brother who dobbed his bigger brothers to his father. Mind you, he was probably right about what he was saying. I don't think for a moment he lied, but certainly he told his father some unpleasant things about his brothers. Read on. Verse 3, Joseph was born when his father Israel, also called Jacob, was old. And then we have number two clue. So Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons. He made Joseph a special robe with long sleeves. And his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than he loved them. So they hated their brother and could not speak to him politely. You can imagine what they said to him. Now, there's a really important lesson in those couple of verses. One of the most difficult things I think in life as a teacher first is to not have favorites. You know, you're my class and I happen to know that that little boy tries his hardest, he's always a good kid and you really have a soft spot for him. On the other hand, that little boy is an absolute pain. He's always cheeky, he's always out of his seat. It is so easy to have favorites and we must not because it can affect children's eternal salvation and we do it in families, don't we? I had a deputy principal once and I'm sorry, I always digress and tell stories and my students always knew that and loved it. They used to try and you know, encourage me to get off the track and talk about stories. But I always remember Ross, he came to me as a deputy principal when there was a kind of a reshuffling and a restructuring and I ended up getting him. I didn't choose him. And he was a good man, he was a Christian, um, he was intelligent, he was capable and he had the most almighty poor self-confidence. He just thought he was inadequate. And 
he was always saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Marin. And, and every time something went wrong in school, I'm sorry, and I'd say, but it's not your fault. Stop saying sorry. And he would say, I'm sorry, and I'd say, stop it. And he would stop. And so one day I got fed up with this, and I said to him, Ross, why are you always saying you're sorry? Why do you always feel that you're inadequate in some way? And he sort of sat there and he thought, and then he said, well, I guess it goes back to when I was a kid. I was the third of four boys, and he said, when my older brothers went to school, they did really well. He did well too. But often, his dad would go along to special awards for the older brothers. Really, yes, he'd definitely go along. And then Ross would say to his dad, I've got an award coming up. Um, and his dad would say, oh, yeah, all right, maybe next year. Or another time he'd say, could you just please come to the end of your graduation? Um, are you getting a special award? No, I'm, I'm just there graduating. Oh, well, maybe I'll, come, maybe I'll come next year. And so through the years, Dad, not meaning, not thinking, subtly told this child that he wasn't as good as his brothers, that he was nowhere near as good as his brothers. And he grew up believing that. The unfortunate thing was, before he came to me, he also married a woman who also did, took great delight in putting him down as well. So when he arrived with me, I thought, I've got hard work to do here. And so for quite a while, I brainwashed him. Every day, I would say, that was really good. You did well. You do a good job. And not once, not twice, but again and again, affirming and encouraging. Can I just say, parents, but grandparents. You know, we do have favourites, don't we? I have two grandchildren. I have Isabella, who is 11 and is such a talented, bright little girl, but she's not always the cute little lovey kid that Liam is. And Liam is nine years old, and he not only looks beautiful, but he has dimples, and he smiles, and he knows how to be cute. And when he was in a pram, when he was about 18 months old, he would sit in the supermarket and smile at people, and I'd be sitting there eating and I'd turn around and I'd see there's some old lady behind here that he's actually flirting with this little kid. He's just got that ability to just, people say, oh, isn't he cute? He hates that word. One day a lady came up to him after church and grabbed him and said, you are so cute, and kissed him. And he's, he's been traumatised ever since. <laughs> but suffice to say, when Isabella may say to me, you love Liam, don't you? And I say, yes, I do, and I love you too. We've got to make sure that we say it, that they know it. We can't assume that they will understand that because it's so easy for us to think, yeah, but I love them. They, they know I love them. You've got to tell them. And guys, it's the same for your wives. You've got to tell them again, again, again. Preferably with flowers, oh, gifts, chocolates, nice things. Okay, back to Joseph. Okay, so the brothers couldn't speak to him. So one stage after this, and we're looking at the next few verses, he had a dream. And he told his brothers about they would have to bow down to him. Even his father was a bit horrified. But look at verse 8. The brother said, do you really think you will be king over us? Do you truly think you're going to rule over us? And hit what? His brothers hated him even more now. So they couldn't speak nicely to him. They disliked him. I bet they bullied him, but they hated him now. He had other dreams, and it just kept rubbing it in. So when they were out minding their sheep one day, the older brothers, the father said to Joseph, I want you to just go out and check on your brothers and make sure they're all right. So he set off, and he was looking for them, and he went from one place, and he went to another place, and he eventually found his brothers. But they saw him coming in the distance and said to each other, here comes that dreamer. And at this stage, obviously, wearing his beautiful coat that showed the favouritism, father had always looked after him and spoiled him, and so as a result, they resented and hated him. And so they decided, what? that they would try and kill him. That was their solution. And they said, right, we can put him down a well and we can dip the 
the clothes in the blood of something or other and take that back to our father and say that he's dead. Now Reuben obviously was a bit squeamish about this. He didn't really fancy this idea at all. So he said, oh look, over there, there's a train of camels. We could sell him as a slave to those merchants. Now was that really a better option? What did slavery mean in those days? It meant working and working and working until you died. It meant that if you were a woman, probably you were frequently raped and used. If you were a man, you would just work to death probably most of the time. But your life was not your own anymore. In fact, it was a living hell. And so the idea of being sold as a slave wasn't much of a better option than being killed or being dumped in a well. Nevertheless, they sold him. And you can have a look at this. In, come down um, to verse 21. But Reuben heard their plan and, sa and saved Joseph. He said, let's not kill him. Don't spill any blood. Throw him into the well in the desert, but don't hurt him. Why? Look on. Reuben planned to save Joseph later and send him back to his father. So Reuben really hoped that Joseph would come out of it okay. Unfortunately, the traders came by, they grabbed him, and that was the end of Joseph. Off he went. Remember, he was how old? 17, sold as a slave. Not good, not good at all. And we know that he had a hard time when he got to Egypt. He worked hard, he was seen as responsible, he rose up in power, but then Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he ended up being sent to jail. There, he met people for whom he told their dreams. And one of the dreams, turn with me over a bit further, um, turn over to chapter 40 now in Genesis, and we're going to have a look at verse 23, the last verse in that chapter, because we've got to condense this a bit, otherwise I'll go too long. There were too many questions, Mr. Halliday, that was the problem. Okay. Verse 23 of chapter 40, but the officer who served the wine, this is the one he told the dream, and he'd been restored to power, did not remember Joseph. He forgot all about him. Poor old Joseph. Read the next verse at the beginning of 41. Two years later. So he's in jail. He sees an opportunity to get out because he's told the dream the man has been saved. Yes, I'll go and I'll speak to the Pharaoh for you. I'll get you out of jail. Don't worry, but he forgot all about him and it was two years before anything more happened. And we all know then that the Pharaoh himself had some ghastly dreams with the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows and compressing that story. We know that um, they called on Joseph in jail, he came out, he took over managing, he was a good manager, I believe that God blessed him as well, and so he organised that nobody in Egypt was going to starve because they managed to store up all the food that they needed. Okay, so then we go to the next little section. Come to chapter 42 with me. And the beginning says, and Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt. And he said to his sons, why are you just sitting here looking at one another? I heard there is grain in Egypt. Go and buy grain for us to eat. So 10 of them went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Benjamin, the younger one, stayed home with dad. Now, we come to the interesting thing. Joseph was the governor over Egypt. He was the one who sold grain to the people. So his brothers came to him and they bowed face down on the ground before him. Verse 7, when he saw his brothers, he knew who they were. But he acted as if he didn't know them and he said unkindly, where do you come from? And they said, we've come from Canaan to buy food. He knew they were his brothers, but they didn't know who he was. And so he really gave them quite a hard time. But eventually, on ver on, come to verse 18, he said to them, I'm a God-fearing man, do this and I'll let you live. If you're honest, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, the rest of you go and carry the grain back to your feed your families, and then bring your youngest brother back here to me. And if you do this, I know you are telling the truth, and then you won't die. So they agreed. 
So they took Simeon, tied him up, and he was a prisoner, and he was the hostage, while the rest of them went back with the grain to their father. They put the grain in their bags, and they set off. Um, unbeknown to them, Jesus, uh, Joseph started playing some tricks. He was determined to get his brothers to realise where they were and what was what. And so he organised for his servants to put their money back in the top of their grain bags. So on their trip back, they stopped for the night. Come with me to verse 26 of chapter 42. So the brothers put the grain on their donkeys and they left. And when they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack. He was going to get food for his donkey. And then he saw his money on the top of his sack and he said, the money I paid for the grain has been put back. Here it is in my sack. What comes next? The brothers were very frightened. They said to each other, what has God done to us? Very interesting, isn't it? Now, we all know that that's part of Joseph's plan and part of God's plan, but they were really quite scared. So they went back to their father and they told him everything and he said, you're not going back. No, no, you're not going back. And he said, you're robbing me of my children. So he, he said to them, they, they needed to get some more and he was worried about his son Simeon. So Reuben now come, steps up, verse 37, and Reuben said to his father, you may put my two sons to death if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. Let me take him back. Trust him to my care. I will bring him back to you. And the father said, no way. I'm not letting you go with Benjamin. Joseph is dead. I'm not letting you have Benjamin. And so they kept asking. And the famine in Canaan went on. A bit like out west where there's no water. They had no food. And eventually they were utterly, utterly desperate. So their father agreed finally. And so come down to chapter 43 now. And we're looking at verse 15. So the brothers took their gifts... And they also took twice as much money as they had taken the first time, and they took Benjamin. They hurried down to jo Egypt and stood before Joseph. In Egypt, Joseph saw Benjamin with them and said to the servants, bring those men into my house, make food for them, they will eat with me today. And the brothers were afraid when they came to Joseph's house because they thought, we were brought here because of the money that was put in our sacks. What's he going to do to us? He wants to attack us and make us slaves and take our donkeys. So they were really, really afraid, and with good reason. Just remember, Joseph was the second most powerful person probably in the known world at that stage. He had the power of off with his head. So it certainly was quite frightening, but nevertheless, he looked after them. So... Come to verse 44 where he sets his next trap. So he said to his servants, fill the men's sacks with as much grain as they can carry and put each man's money into his sack with the grain and put my silver cup in the sack of the youngest brother and put money for that grain in that sack. And the servants did what, he was what they were told. So at dawn, we're coming now to chapter 44, we're looking at verse 3. At dawn, the brothers went off with their donkeys. They weren't far from the city when Joseph said to his men, right, go after them. When you catch up with them, say, why have you paid back evil for good? So he caught up with them. And verse 7, I just, I have to laugh almost, and, and it's so like us, we make silly statements Read verse 7 with me. But the brothers said to the servant, Why do you say these things? We would not do anything like that. We brought back to you the money that we found in our sacks the first time. And surely we wouldn't steal silver or gold from you. And then they make the stupid mistake and say, If you find that silver cup in the sack of one of us, then let him die and we will be your slaves. Did they know what they were saying? No, they hadn't got a clue. And you imagine how ill they would have felt when they realized. So the servant said, we'll do as you say, but only the man who's taken the cup will become the slave. The rest of you can go free. So they opened their 
They lowered their sacks to the ground, they opened them up, they searched from them, and they found the cup in Benjamin's sack. And it says in verse 13, the brothers tore their clothes to show they were sad. They were horrified. They had told their aged father, let us take Benjamin back as this ruler wants, because we will keep him safe. And if we can't return him to you, Reuben said, you may kill two of my sons. Pretty awful situation. Talk about between a rock and a hard place. That would have been just dreadful. Okay, so back they had to go. And they went back to Joseph's house. And they bowed down on the ground before him. And Joseph said, what have you done? And Judah said, what can we say? How can we show that we're not guilty? God has uncovered us, so we'll all be your slaves, not just Benjamin. But Joseph said, I won't make you slaves. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you can go back to your father. And so they, they talked to him, and they pleaded. And all this time, Joseph was listening. Now, up to that point, Joseph had been using a translator to speak with them. So they didn't realize that he could understand every word that they were saying. So they're all talking amongst themselves, what can we do? They're panic-stricken, they're terrified, they're so worried for Benjamin, they're worried for themselves, they also need to take grain back for their father. They, they just, it's a nightmare situation. And so we come now to the next section, and this is lovely. So turn with me to chapter 45 now. And it says, Joseph could not control himself in front of his servants any longer. So he cried out, everybody go. And when only the brothers were left with Joseph, he told them who he was. How do you think they felt? Do you think they were overjoyed and saying, oh goody, this is Joseph, how lovely. Do you think they felt like that? I'd say they were even more scared. This was the brother that they'd sold to be a slave, that they had bullied when he was little, could not speak politely to him. They probably used awful language to him. They bullied him. They treated him like dirt. Then they sell him as a slave, and now he's the boss. Woohoo! Revenge, big time. You think so? Let's have a look and see what the Bible says. All right. Verse 2 of chapter 45, Joseph cried so loudly that the Egyptians outside heard him and the people heard about it. And he said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? What does it say next? And I love this verse. But the brothers could not answer him because they were very afraid of him. They would have been terrified. He could say all he liked, but they knew that they were in a very difficult place because Joseph could deal with them and he could take his revenge on them if he wanted. But did he? Read on verse four. So Joseph said to them, come close to me. Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't think they would have wanted to, but they, they had to. So they came close to him and he said to them, I'm your brother Joseph. And he reminds them, you sold me as a slave to go into Egypt. And then he says, verse five, now don't be worried. Excuse me? Now don't be worried? Were they expecting that? No. And he goes on, don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Unbelievable that he would say that. And then he gives the reason, God sent me here ahead of you to save people's lives. Okay? Now, I want you to stop for a moment and just think, why did jo Joseph behave that way? What were the sort of values and why did Joseph do those things? What, how could Joseph do those things? How could Joseph be nice to his brothers? After, I mean, they hadn't just done the one thing. They'd been nasty to him all through his childhood. They'd sold him as a slave they had treated him so badly and he was now in power and he didn't take any revenge. He said, don't be worried and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me as a slave. It's okay. Is that what you would expect to hear? Not in human thinking. So why was Joseph able to do that? I want you now to turn with me 
and I want you to come across to Romans. We're going to go right to the end of the Bible because this is where I love the Bible that the same themes are there. And I want you to turn to Romans and I want you to turn to chapter 12. So find it again. What were these values? And these words are just so important for us. And it says, verse nine of chapter 12, Romans, your love must be real. What does that mean, real? Not silly sentimental, not what we would call a fair weather friend, sometimes nice and sometimes nasty. Real love lasts all the time, doesn't it? Real love means that you will love someone no matter what. Now, sometimes as parents, we get really annoyed with our children or our grandchildren, but you still love them, don't you? And that love is so important, so read on. Your love must be real, hate what is evil, hold on to what is good. Love each other like brothers and sisters. Give your brothers and sisters more honor than you want for yourselves. And there's some nice little words there about not being lazy and working hard. Some of us overdo that and are workaholics. This is just a little pointer to those of you who are workaholics, and I'm thinking of a few people in the room. Just make sure that you keep it under control. Now, come over the page. This is the way that we are to treat people. Look at verse 14. Wish good for those who do bad things to you. Wish them well and do not curse them. Is that easy? Can you do that in your own strength? I can't. I'm a human being like everybody else. And no matter how hard I try, if somebody's really horrid to me, I find it very hard to be really loving but we can, and God wants us to. Let's read on. Verse 17, if someone does wrong to you, do not pay him back by doing wrong to him. Try to do what everyone thinks is right. Do your best to live in peace with everyone. My friends, verse 19, do not try to punish others when they wrong you. Wait for God, he'll do it. I recently, well, actually, no, is it? A couple of years ago, I, I had a conversation with an older lady in Brisbane, and she was talking to me about someone, a relative, her daughter-in-law actually, that she knew. And she didn't have a good word to say for her anywhere, nothing. It was just always thinking the worst of her, always assuming that all of her actions, totally judgmental, but no kindness, no love, no understanding, no forgiveness. And I said to her one day, you really need to forgive her. And I mean, she had done some awful things to her mother-in-law, so, you know, she had, she had grounds to be fairly annoyed. And I said to her, you really need to forgive her. And she sort of looked at me and I said, well, first of all, because God tells us to, we just read it. Also, most important, because if we don't, if God asks us to love and forgive people who've wronged us, and we don't, then that actually can keep us out of the kingdom. And that's the bottom line. It's the fact that yes, um, so-and-so, so-and-so was horrible to me, and I really detest them, I'm just going to avoid them. Isn't that a, an option that we often tend to take? I just won't go near that nasty person because they upset me. What is the Bible telling us? It's telling us to care for those people and to try and learn to love them. Now I want to say to you, I, I am absolutely convinced that forgiveness is a specific gift from God. I do not believe that you, you, any of you, have it within your heart to be such good people I know you're lovely people, but to be such good people that if someone did something really awful to you, you could just forgive them like that. It doesn't happen that way. It's not easy. You might be able to do it over some little thing. Yeah, we can let it go. You know, I've, I've done that many times. But what if it was something really horrible? What if, for example, somebody 
killed my granddaughter. Please, God, may this never happen. But what if somebody did that? How would I then feel towards that person? Because this is about making this real. God is saying that we have to forgive. And it's not enough to just say the words, but we need to think it in our hearts and really forgive people when they've wronged us. And people do wrong us. And the only way that I believe we can get it is by prayer and by asking God to give us that gift of forgiveness. In your own self, you don't even want to forgive them. Got no desire to forgive them at all. You might be saying the words because you're a good Christian. Oh, yes. But really forgiving in your heart. Do you do it? It's a gift that we ask God to give us, that ability to forgive. And sometimes you see it in the papers, don't you, where somebody has been killed and it's been a dreadful situation and then the relative will say, but I've forgiven that person. And I just look and I think, wow, how could you? Not in your own strength. It's a gift of God, that gift of forgiveness. So I guess for me, I want to say to, to, to each one of you and to myself, Think in your own life of people who maybe have not done the right thing by you and could have. It wasn't just an accident. They were deliberately mean or they were really plain nasty. We need to make sure that that act does not come between us and Jesus. Because if in fact we're holding on to that and we still cannot forgive that person, that can be enough to keep us away from the kingdom because we haven't surrendered it to God. We need to. We need to pray about it. We ask the Lord to give us. Please help me forgive that person. Now, I always start with just praying for the person. Just pray for them. If there is somebody that annoys you or if there is a child in school that I'm teaching and that child seems to be absolutely hell-bent on trying to make my life an utter wreck, then that's the child that I need to pray for. And as a school principal, because I was 30 years as a state school principal, I sometimes had teachers on staff that I would love to get rid of because they weren't, and it wasn't a Christian school, but they weren't kind to the children or they were lazy or they were sarcastic and nasty. And I did everything that I could do in my professional sense but then I would pray about it. And I would say to the Lord, morning, noon, and night, please just fix that person. Just look after them. Please just care for them. And I would find after a period of time, something would happen. Either the person would have a little bit of a breakdown and come to me and say, I'm sorry about something. But I can count at least three situations where that person came to me and said I'm going to go and work somewhere else I hope you can cope without me um, I've had a transfer or I've had a promotion or my husband's just retired so I'm going to retire as well and I used to think to myself just take it to God in prayer and he will fix it but don't have the cheek to try or the temerity to tell him how to do it he will do it the way he wants to and sometimes you can only laugh because you can see that his humour is there. So can I just say to each one of you, God bless you all. May we meet in the kingdom one day, and may it be because none of us, me included, that none of us have held on to unforgiveness, dislike, hatred of someone, no matter what they've done. That's not the issue. They've done that. That's their problem. The issue is you being right with God. He wants us to forgive. May God bless you. Thank you very much.